land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me When the Emperor was divine by Julia Atsuka. Chapter titled, When the Emperor was Divine. At night he woke up crying out, Where am I? Sometimes he felt a hand on his shoulder, and it was his sister telling him it was all just a bad dream. Go back to sleep, baby, she'd whisper, and he would. Sometimes there was no answer. Sometimes he heard the wind blowing through the sagebrush, and he remembered he was in the desert, but he could not remember how long he had been there or why. Sometimes he worried he was there because he'd done something horribly, terribly wrong. But then he, when he tried to remember what was horrible, terrible, what that horrible, terrible thing might be, it would not come to him. It could be anything, something he'd done yesterday, chewing the eraser off his sister's pencil before putting it back in the pencil jar, or something he'd done a long time ago that was just now catching up with him, breaking a chain letter from Juneau, Alaska, flushing his dying pet goldfish, goldfish down the toilet before it was completely dead, forgetting to touch the hat rack three times when the ice man drove by. Sometimes he thought he was dreaming, and he was sure that when he woke up his father would be downstairs in the kitchen whistling, begin the beguine through his teeth as he fried up breakfast in the skillet. Here comes champ, his father would say, one hobo egg sandwich. His sister had long, skinny legs and thick black hair and wore a gold French watch that had once belonged to their father. Whenever she went out, she covered her head with a wide-brimmed Panama hat so her face would not get too dark from the sun. Nobody will look at you, she said to the boy, if your face is too dark. Nobody's looking at me anyway, he replied. Late at night, after the lights had gone out, she told him things. Beyond the fence, she said, there was a dry riverbed and an abandoned smelter mine and at the edge of the desert there were jagged blue mountains that rose up into the sky. The mountains were farther away than they seemed. Everything was in the desert, everything except water. Water, she said, is just a mirage. A mirage was not there at all. The mountains were called Big Drum and Little Drum, Snake Ridge, the Rubies. The nearest town over was Delta. In Delta, she said, you could buy oranges. In Delta, there were green leafy trees and blonde boys on bikes and a hotel with a veranda where the waiters served ice-cold drinks with tiny paper umbrellas. What else? asked the boy. In Delta, she said, there was shade. She told him about the ancient salt lake that had once covered all of Utah and parts of Nevada. This was thousands of years ago, she said, during the Ice Age. There were no fences then, and no names, no Utah, no Nevada. Just lots and lots of water. And where were, where are we now? Yes? Excuse me. And where were, where we are now? Yes? 600 feet under. All night long he dreamed of water. Endless days of rain. Overflowing canals and rivers and streams rushing down to the sea. He saw the ancient salt lake floating above the desert. Above the floor of the desert. Its surface was calm and blue. Smooth as glass. He was drifting down through the reeds and fish were swimming through his fingers, and when he looked up through the water, the sun was nothing but a pale, wobbly speck a hundred million miles above his head. In the morning he woke up longing for a glass of coke, just one, with lots of ice and a straw. He'd sip it slowly. He'd make it last a long, long time. A day, a week, a year even. Every few days the letters arrived, tattered and torn, from Lordsburg, New Mexico. Sometimes entire sentences had been cut out with a razor blade by the censors and the letters did not make any sense. Sometimes they arrived in one piece, but with half of the words blacked out. Always they were signed, From Papa, With Love. Lordsburg was a nice sunny place on a broad highland plain just north of the Mexican border. That was how his father had described it in his letters. There are no trees here, but the sunsets are beautiful and on clear days you can see the hills rising up in the distance. The food is fresh and substantial and my appetite is good. Although it is still very warm, I have begun taking a cold shower every morning to better prepare myself for the winter. Please write and tell me what you are 
interested in these days? Do you still like baseball? How is your sister? Do you have a best friend? The boy still liked baseball and he was very interested in outlaws. He had seen a movie about the Dalton gang when the Daltons rode in Recreation Hall 22. His sister had won second prize in a jitterbug contest at the mess hall. She wore her hair in a ponytail. She was fine. The boy did not have a best friend, but he had a pet tortoise that he kept in a wooden box filled with sand right next to the barrack window. He had not given the tortoise a name, but he had scratched his family's identification number into its shell with the tip of his mother's nail file. At night, he covered the box with the lid, and on top of the lid, he placed a flat white stone so the tortoise could not escape. Sometimes, in his dreams, he could hear its claws scrabbling against the side of the box. He did not mention the scrabbling claws to his father. He did not mention his dreams. What he said was, Dear Papa, it's pretty sunny here in Utah, too. The food is not so bad, and we get milk every day. In the mess hall, they are collecting nails for Uncle Sam. Yesterday, my kite got stuck on the fence. The rules about the fence were simple. You could not go over it. You could not go under it. You could not go around it. You could not go through it. And if your kite got stuck on it, that was an easy one. You let the kite go. There are rules about language, too. Here we say dining hall and not mess hall, safety council and not internal police, residents, not evacuees, and last but not least, mental climate, not morale. There are rules about food, no second helpings except for milk and bread, and books, no books in Japanese. There are rules about religion, no emperor worshipping, Shinto's allowed. In Lordsburg, the girl said, the sky was always blue, and the fences were not so high. Only fathers lived there. At night, they could see the stars, and during the day, eagles. Our father, our father does not worship the emperor. She said that, too. Does he ever think about us? asked the boy. All the time. His father was a small, handsome man with delicate hands and a raised white scar on his index finger that the boy as a young child had loved to kiss. Does it hurt? He'd once asked him. Not anymore, his father had replied. He was extremely polite. Whenever he walked into a room, he closed the door behind him softly. He was always on time. He wore beautiful suits and did not yell at waiters. He loved pistachio nuts. He believed that fruit juice was the ideal drink. He liked to doodle. He was especially fond of drawing a box and then making it into three dimensions. I guess you could say that's my forte. Whenever the boy knocked on his door and his father would look up and smile and put down whatever it was he was doing. Don't be shy, he'd say. He read the examiner every morning before work and he knew the answers to everything. How small a germ was and when did fish sleep and where did uh, Kitty McKenzie go after they took her out of her iron lung. You don't have to worry about Kitty McKenzie anymore. She's in a better place now. She's up there in heaven. I heard they threw her a big party the day she arrived. He knew when to leave the boy's mother alone and how best to ask her for ice cream. Don't ask her too often, and when you do, don't let her know how much you really want it. Don't beg. Don't whine. He knew which restaurants would serve them lunch and which would not. He knew which barbers would cut their kind of hair. The best ones, of course. The thing that he loved most about America he once confided to the boy was the glazed jelly donut. Can't be beat. His mother said it aged you, the sun. She looked, uh, she said it made you grow old. Every night before she went to bed, she daubed cream on her face. She rationed it out as though it were butter or sugar. It was ponds. She bought a large jar at the pharmacy the day before. Uh, they had left Berkeley. Gotta make it last, she said, but already she had almost used it all up. I should have planned ahead, she said. I should have bought two. Maybe three, said the boy. She stood in front of the mirror, tracing the lines along her forehead and neck with her finger. Is it the light, she asked, or are there bags under my eyes? There's bags. She pointed to a wrinkle by her mouth. See this? He nodded. A recent development. 
Your father won't know who I am. I'll remind him. Tell him, she said. Then her voice drifted off, and she was somewhere far away, and outside a hot dry wind was blowing up from the south and across the high desert plains. Always he would remember the dust. It was soft and white and chalky, like talcum powder. Only the alkaline made your skin burn. It made your nose bleed. It made your eyes sting. It took your voice away. The dust got into your shoes, your hair, your pants, your mouth, your bed, your dreams. It seeped under doors and around the edges of windows and through the cracks in the walls. And all day long, it seemed, his mother was always sweeping. Once in a while, she would put down her broom and look at him. What I wouldn't give, she'd say, for my Electrolux. One evening, before he went to bed, he wrote his name in the dust across the table. All through the night while he slept, more dust blew through the walls. By morning, his name was gone. His father used to call him Little Guy. He called him Gumdrop and Peanut and Plum. You're my absolute numero uno, he would say to him. And whenever the boy had woken up screaming from dark, scary dreams, his father had come into his room and sat down at the edge of his bed and smoothed down the boy's short black hair. Hush, puppy, he whispered. It's all right. Here I am. At dusk, the sky turned blood red, and his sister took him out, walking along the outer edge of the barracks to watch the sun go down over the mountains. Look, look away, look, look away. That, she told him, was the proper way to look at the sun. If you stared at it straight on for too long, you'd go blind. In the, dark, in the darkening red twilight, they would point out to each other things that they saw. A dog chasing a porcupine, a tiny pink seashell, the husk of a beetle, a column of fire ants marching across the sand. If they were lucky, they might see the Portuguese lady strolling along the fence with her husband, Sakamoto, or the lady with the white turban. She'd lost all her hair, they'd heard, overnight on the train. Or the man with the withered arm who lived in Block 7. If they were very lucky, the man with the withered arm might even raise it, the arm, and wave to them. One evening, while they were walking, the boy reached over and grabbed the girl's arm. What is it? she asked him. He tapped his wrist. Time, he said. What time? She stopped and looked at her watch as though she had never seen it before. It's six o'clock, she said. Her watch had said six o'clock for weeks. She had stopped winding it the day they had stepped off the train. What do you think they're doing back home? She looked at her watch one more time, and then she stared up at the sky as though she were thinking. Right about now, she said, I bet they're having a good time. Then she started walking again. And in his mind, he could see it. The tree-lined streets at sundown, the dark green lawns, the sidewalks, boys throwing balls in backyards, Girls playing hopscotch, mothers with pink quilted mitts sliding hot casseroles out of ovens, fathers with shiny black briefcases bursting through the front doors shouting, Honey, I'm home! Honey, I'm home! When he thought of the world outside, it was always six o'clock, a Wednesday or a Thursday, dinner time across America. In early autumn, the farm recruiters arrived to sign up new workers in the War Relocation Authority allowed many of the young men and women to go out and help harvest the crops. Some of them went north to Idaho to top sugar beets. Some went to Wyoming to pick potatoes. Some went to Tent City in Provo to pick peaches and pears. And at the end of the season, they came back wearing brand new Florsheim shoes. Some came back wearing the same shoes they'd left in and swore they'd never go out there again. They said they'd been shot at, spat on, refused entrance to the local diner, the movie theater, the dry goods store. They said the signs in the windows were the same wherever they went. No Japs allowed. Life was easier, they said, on this side of the fence. The shoes were black Oxfords. Men's, size eight and a half, extra narrow. He took them out of his suitcase and slipped them over his hands and pressed his fingers into the smooth oval depressions left behind by his father's toes when he closed his eyes and sniffed the tips of his fingers. Tonight they smelled like nothing. The week before they'd still smelled of his father, but tonight the smell of his father was gone. He wiped off the lever with, leather with his sleeve and put the shoes back into the suitcase. Outside it was dark in the barrack windows. 
There were lights on and figures moving behind the curtains. He wondered what his father was doing right then. Getting ready for bed, maybe, washing his face or brushing his teeth. Did they even have toothpaste in Lordsburg? He didn't know. He'd have to write him and ask. He lay down on his cot and pulled up the blankets. He could hear his mother snoring softly in the darkness and a lone coyote in the hills to the south howling up at the moon. He wondered if you could see the moon, the same moon in Lordsburg or London or even China where all the men wore little black slippers and he decided that you could depending on the clouds. Same moon, he whispered to himself, same moon. On nights when he couldn't go to sleep, excuse me, on nights when he couldn't sleep, he liked to think of the house they had left behind. He could still picture his old room very clearly. Uh, the one war, one world map of the world on the wall, the Joe Palooka comic book spilling out from under the bed, the cowboy and Indian curtains his mother had sewn for him the summer before last, gently billowing in the breeze. He'd look out the window and see his father down below in the yard, plucking the caterpillars one by one off the snow pea plants along his long, with his long wooden chopsticks. He'd see the stone lantern covered with moss in the garden and the statue of the fat Buddha with his head thrust back, laughing up at the sky. He'd see his red Schwinn with wide balloon tires leaning against the porch, and on a good day, he'd see, he'd see Elizabeth Morgana Roosevelt on the other side of the white picket fence, playing with her little dog in the sun. Land, lots of land on the starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't.